Along with water, transportation is one of the top concerns voiced by district residents. A proposition on the California state ballot this November will repeal the 2017 SB1 gas tax, which has brought in funding for roadway projects across the state. Contrary to traditional party beliefs on taxes, Republican Congressman Denham has declined to support the repeal effort of the gas tax, and Democratic challenger Harder has stated that he supports the repeal of the tax. In light of your stances on SB1, would you support a new gas tax to fund a federal infrastructure plan? And what would you do to improve transportation in general throughout the district? Mr. Denham? Sure. Well, I'm proud to be uh, on the Transportation Infrastructure Committee, where I've uh, not only fought to expand H-Train um, and uh, move uh, more people by, by uh, rail, but also expanding our freeways. You know, the question is, do you actually uh, able to bring money back home? Yes. The only grant in the st entire state was on 132 in our district. It's because we've got one of the biggest challenges moving uh, east to west and getting commuters. Uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, commuters here locally. So. Uh, I've got a proven track record on the issue. Um, I am opposed to raising the gas tax. Uh, I, it wasn't in a position I initially came out and was very vocal on because I was focused on uh, an initiative that I was pushing, the Voter Protection Act. I believe that uh, anytime voters approve something, that the money's got to go where it says it was. We passed two different water bonds. We did built no storage as a state. Uh, we've seen uh, transportation uh, money go to the trust fund only to see governors steal the trust fund money and never repay it. So I was pushing the Voter Protection Act, but I've been very clear I'm against tax uh, cuts. He's at, uh, tax, uh, raising the taxes on gas. He's been on both sides of the issue, and it'd be interesting to see how he answers it today. But we've got him on video saying both ways. It's your words. I'll show you the video. We'll run tape later. All right, Mr. Mean? Harder. Yeah. <laughs> I think I've been 100% consistent. We wrote an op-ed in the Turlock Journal. If you've read your local newspaper, you I've might read have it. seen it. And I've also um, talked to the unions that you've changed their position, and we've got you on tape. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Harder, please, please, we're trying to get through these questions. Please, we're trying to get through these questions. I hate to ask anybody to leave. All right, Mr. Harder, please answer the question. I've been very consistent about this. We haven't changed an inch. Uh, I think we have a huge infrastructure problem here in the Central Valley. There's 57 bridges in this district, in this, uh, in this county even, uh, that are failing, according to the American Civil Corps of Engineers. I drive over one every single day, and I look at the rivets on the side, and I think, oh my gosh, I really hope Congress does its job and fixes this bridge before tomorrow, and I have to drive over it all over again, but we haven't seen it. Uh, we have not seen uh, the transportation and the infrastructure funding that was promised uh, this is a, something that I actually agreed with uh, President Trump on when he was running in 2016. He said we needed a massive dose of infrastructure. Uh, and what did we get? After he got elected, uh, the biggest infrastructure problem that they f thought about was privatizing air traffic control. Uh, I don't think that's exactly the biggest transportation problem we have here in the Valley. Uh, we have a lot of commuters, as, uh, as uh, the Congressman said. We have a lot of bridges. But the reason that we do that is because Congress is not actually doing its job. And it's actually irresponsible that we have a member of Congress in this district who sits on the Transportation Committee, who has let our roads and bridges degrade further over the last eight years that he's been in office than what it was before. Uh, we need to make sure that we're doing it. We need to be doing it the right way, which is being paid by Washington actually doing its job. Thank you. Mr. Denham, do you have a rebuttal? Yeah, again, I've got a record that I'm very proud of. In 2015, uh, infrastructure bill, we actually expanded and I put the amendment in uh, to actually create uh, safety measures on our bridges. We want more funding to go to the bridges. Don't take my word for it. Talk to the county, talk to our supervisors. The 7th Street Bridge is one I talk about all the time, making sure that we actually get safe uh, infrastructure in place. But look, when I was in the state senate, we also worked on a state bond. Put a billion, a, a billion dollars on Highway 99. You think he voted in that election? You know, it's one thing to criticize my position, but at least show up and vote. 17 out of 20 elections, he didn't start voting until he decided to move back to the district and, and run for office. If you want people to vote for you, if you want to take a position on important issues, at least utilize your right to vote. Mr. Harder, do you have a rebuttal? Thank you for bringing that up. You're right. I was complacent about politics. Uh, I don't have a voting record that I'm always proud of because the reality is, is I didn't always think my vote counted. What changed was the election of 2016. 
What changed was the last two years of seeing on every issue that I've always cared about, uh, making sure that people have access to health care, making sure that we have immigration reform here in the district, making sure that we have the water infrastructure projects that were promised, on every issue that I cared about, we were being misrepresented by someone that voted with his party 98% of the time. So you're right, Congressman, uh, to call me out and say that I was complacent. But the reality is, is that complacency is gone, and it's all thanks to you. Uh, and the reality is, is we've seen that all across this district. 95% of the 3,000 people knocking on doors as part of our campaign have not knocked on a door ever before. So the reality is, is thanks to your efforts over the last two years, you're seeing folks come out of the woodwork to make sure that everybody votes in this election coming up. Thank you for that. Please hold your applause so we can get to this section. Okay, our next topic is on health care. The issue of health care is far from settled in the country. Thousands of District 10 residents are uninsured and many more rely on Medi-Cal. The area has a severe physician shortage and district emergency rooms are being impacted by droves of residents using it as their only source of medical care. Valley residents are also more likely to die from chronic diseases than people who live elsewhere in California. How would you help to alleviate these issues? And specifically, what would you support in a federal health care bill? Mr. Harder? This is probably the single biggest difference between me and my opponent. Uh, we live in a district with enormous health care challenges. We have nearly 50% of our residents on Medicaid, which means that because of our congressman's vote May 4th, 2017, the day that I definitely lost my complacency about politics, uh, 100,000 residents in this district would lose health care because of that vote. 100,000 people. My younger brother David, right here, is one of them. Uh, born 10 weeks pr premature, spent the first two years of his life in and out of a hospital, in and out of a manual, among others. He came out with a health care bill 104 pages long. And because of that, thankfully he's healthy, he's our best uh, door knocker knocking on doors every day, my brother wouldn't have health care until he's 65 and on Medicare. There's 100,000 people in our district in the exact same boat. So unlike Congressman Denham, I will fight every single day to make sure that people with pre-existing conditions, cancer, diabetes, pregnancy, childhood asthma, are protected under the law. And second, I will make sure that every American in the Central Valley and across this country has access to affordable and high quality health care. That's my plan. Thank you. And thank you for refraining from applause. I know it's hard. I know it's hard. All right, Mr. Denham? Well, on this issue, he actually has put out a plan, and I would agree that we are very different on the issues. Uh, when you end Obamacare and um, cut our, or eliminate all of our our employer provided health care, when you throw unions that have uh, negotiated with Kaiser, uh, when you end their plans, when you end the VA, our veterans, uh, and, and do uh, Medicare for all, uh, it affects all of our health care, including the seniors. It will rob the seniors uh, fund. But the biggest question is, with your plan, how do you come up with $32 trillion? Who are you going to tax beyond all the other taxes you propose to come up with $32 trillion? Not even Jerry Brown supports this plan. I mean, again, when you talk about Bay Area principles, this is one of the biggest principles. Now, I do have a plan, and I've actually been putting our issues out there. We have an access issue here in the Valley. We've always had a, a shortage of doctors, so I actually introduced the amendment that doubled our residency program. We've been trying to push for years to get medical schools right here in the Valley, and all the medical schools say, why would we have more people graduate from our medical schools if you have no residency program for them to go to uh, to work at? So we've doubled the residency program. We've also added uh, teaching hospitals, our federally qualified health centers, so that we can actually have more doctors there too. We also have to start paying doctors to, to see patients. Uh, I've worked with the California Medical Society and the Stanislaus uh, Society to actually make sure that we're running a pilot program here to make sure they get paid, on time and actually paid a wage to see those Medi-Cal patients here locally. It's one thing to get an insurance card, it's another thing to actually make sure that your patients are, are being taken care of and getting quality health care. Again, I've got a record, I'm proud of it, and it's, uh, it's all right there in writing. All right, Mr. Hardy, do you have a rebuttal? You're right, it is there in writing. And uh, I remember that moment uh, a year and a half ago when you stood at your last town hall in front of a thousand constituents, I see some faces here that were there that night, and you said you would vote against that health care bill. 
because you knew how terrible it was. You knew that 100,000 residents in this district would have lost health care coverage because of that vote. So don't tell me about the health care plan that you wish you had. That's the health care plan you voted for. And that health care plan would have deprived this district uh, of health care access. It would have devastated our community. Uh, and we all know it was terrible because you said you would vote against it before you actually voted for it a, year and a, half, a week and a half later in Washington. Uh, and don't tell me about what we can afford, because the reality is, is under the last two years, where we've had a Republican House, a Republican Senate, and a Republican presidency, health care premiums have skyrocketed. Uh, estimates have they're going to increase in the Central Valley by up to 50% for a family of four in this district next year. Tell me how we're going to afford that. Well, first of all, in your plan, $32 trillion, which you still fail to answer the question, uh, when you decide to raise taxes on two, the top 2%, and you re repeal the tax cuts for our district, $2,100 per family, that still only gets you $2 trillion. Where do you come up with the other $30 trillion that will devastate and bankrupt this country? It's not a real plan. But our access issue, actually, it's not a wish. It's now law. Because I led on the issue. It is a fact that we actually have more residencies here. Don't take my word for it. Go talk to the doctors here locally. Talk to the California Medical Association. Not necessarily a conservative group, but I've worked with them to make sure we're providing real results in our community, to make sure doctors actually see our patients. We need to make sure that we've got access to health care. And that means that uh, we don't want to see the overcrowding emergency rooms. That means we actually provide the health care. And the fact is that the two bills have been signed into law, and we're putting them in place now. All right, thank you. Our next topic of discussion will be on immigration. President Trump has been working to end the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DREAMers Act, enacted by President Obama in 2012. Congress has yet to pass an immigration reform bill that would provide a path to citizenship for the thousands of children brought to the United States illegally as children who are now in danger of being deported. Earlier this year, we saw a zero tolerance illegal entry policy with children being separated from their parents when they are detained crossing the U.S. border. President Trump is also seeking additional funding to build a border wall between the United States and Mexico. What would you support in an immigration reform bill and how does that help the people of District 10? Mr. Gunnar? Uh, again, I've got a record that I'm proud of. I took on Nancy Pelosi and Paul Ryan both. Don't take my word for it. Take a look at it. Look at the plan. It's the first time a comprehensive plan has actually been pushed forward and taken a vote and debated on the House floor. I'm not somebody who's just going to take a back seat on such an important issue. I did everything I could. I learned actually the, the parliamentary rules to, uh, to avoid having a bill that was shut down. And we negotiated it. Yes, it has tough border security on it. We make sure that we actually secure our border with both technology as well as a physical barrier. We have a, a fix for dreamers from day one. I would say one of the big, biggest successes of this is we now have over half of the Republicans on record supporting a pathway to citizenship and a permanent fix for our dreamers. We also uh, dealt with the visa system and a guest worker program, two things that are critical to this community. But as we saw child, children get separated, look, I'm a father. Um, it is something that was important to me. I introduced the only bill in Congress to address the issue. I'm a leader on the issue. I will continue to lead on the issue because it's a critical issue for our community. Again, his position is more with the Bay Area of sanctuary cities and abolishing ICE. Those are not things that I can support. Mr. Harder. I don't know where you get your facts. I think these must be the alternative facts that I keep hearing uh, from Washington. It's on tape. We've got a tape. We'll roll tape afterwards. <laughs> of me saying I, I want to abolish ICE, I, I'd love to hear that. I have never said it, and I don't support Sanctuary it. Sanctuary cities. Uh, the reality is, is we have an immigration disaster that's affecting the Central Valley every single day. We are a land of immigrants. Uh, that is our values. We're a district where we see it every single day. There's a young woman in our campaign who's working two part-time jobs. A uh, student at Modesto Junior College wants to grow up, be a pharmacist, live the American dream, work hard and get ahead. But her parents carried her over the border when she was three months old. Uh, her DACA protection from deportation expired last October. She doesn't know what the future is going to hold for her. There's 10,000 people in this district with the exact same story, 2 million across America. 
Uh, this is all too common, and it's a complete self-inflicted wound. And it's not complicated about what we have to do. We know we need to pass a bill that protects these kids. I've uh, been in our school districts for decades. They're a part of our fabric of our entire community. And what can we do? Jeff Benham has released an awful lot of press releases on this issue. He talks about it a whole lot back in the district because he knows that everybody in this district, at least most folks, actually want it to happen. But when he goes back to Washington, what do we see? We see a record of absolute failure. Uh, we see uh, absolute no movement forward on a Clean Dream Act. He's sponsored a bill, but he said he wouldn't actually sign a petition to bring that Clean Dream Act to a vote on the floor of the House. Uh, We've seen this partisan bickering, but there's no excuse. When your party controls every branch of government, House, Senate, presidency, who are you going to blame? The only person to blame is the failures of the last two years, which fall 100% on your feet, and we're paying the price in this district. It's a good talking point. It's a good talking point. Uh, only this has been something that's been going on for decades. Democrats had control of both houses and the presidency. Uh, a president that he didn't vote for the first time or the second time because he doesn't vote in those elections. I would think that he'd be more involved on, on those issues as well. But look, Democrats had control of everything and couldn't pass the Clean Dream Act. I'm not here for politics. Believe me, this is not an issue, uh, this is not an issue that uh, has been difficult. It's been, a, it's been difficult to explain to not only my Republican colleagues uh, in the House, but coming home here, running in a primary. Um, talking to Republican groups and explaining my position. Any more than it's been easy talking to Democrat groups. This isn't about press releases. If anything, it's been a challenge to explain to people on such a big, comprehensive issue why I want border security, why I also want a fix for dreamers. Now, I've signed on to the Clean Dream Act. He knows that. He, I signed on to the Gang of Eight bill that came out of the Senate. He knows that, too. But he doesn't let the facts get in the way of, of what I've been trying to do. I introduced the Enlist Act in my first term in Congress and have pushed this now for eight years. While this has been an issue for several decades, I've been a leader on the issue and I'm proud of it. Mr. Harder, do you have a rebuttal? I'm going to solve this mystery for you. Uh, I think the reason you're having trouble explaining your position is because people see your votes. Uh, people see the fact that, yes, you did sign on to the Gang of Eight bill, which had comprehensive immigration reform. And then you say you, you said you'd vote against it if it actually came to a vote in the floor of the House. The only reason that that bill is not law today is because House Republicans, including Congressman Denham, stood against it when push came to shove. You have a voting record 98% of the time voting with your party, 98% of the time. I don't know anybody that I agree with 98% of the time. You can ask my wife. <laughs> oh. The reality is, is we need somebody who's going to fight first and foremost for the constituents in this district. and. You know, you said yourself, there is not a single immigration bill that can get 218 votes from Republicans in the House. You've said that many times. And you know what? I agree with you. And the reaction from that is that we need to win some elections if we're going to get immigration reform passed in this country. Yeah, just like Democrats had control of both houses, they couldn't pass a Clean Dream Act. Republicans couldn't pass it on a 218 vote. This is a bipartisan issue that's going to take America coming together on an American solution. Making sure that we actually address all aspects of it. Um, and that's everything from border security uh, to DREAMers to a visa system that works, as well as a guest worker program. We've got to come together as Americans on this for an American solution. And it's not going to be easy. Not everybody's going to want to become an American citizen. It's going to be an earned pathway. But again, I've signed on to these different bills because they're important to my community. It's something I'll continue to fight for and never back down on. Whether I'm talking to the most liberal group, the most conservative group, or members back in D.C., this is what I believe. This is what I'll fight for, and I'll let the uh, the different bills that I've co-authored speak for themselves. I've got a record on this, one that I'm proud of, and one that I'll continue to fight for. Mr. Harder, would you like a second rebuttal? I think we said it again. I mean, I, I think the reality is, is 98% of the time, voting speaks for itself. Uh, you're right, Jeff Denham. You have again and again co-sponsored bills and then every time you get the call from your party leadership to drop it you do uh, you said you had the votes again and again i saw you on cnn every single day uh, saying that you had the votes to push forward uh, immigration reform and what happened you let the deadline expire you voted against that discharge petition because you got assurances from your party leadership and you know what we got absolutely nothing 
Uh, we did not see, we saw a vote that take, took place that was not bipartisan because you decided to ignore the other half of the idol. You decided to only work with your party leadership. The reality is, is I hear every single day from dreamers in this district who feel betrayed because the, their lives have gotten worse over the eight years that you've been in Congress. Yeah, votes do matter. Okay. Votes do matter, you should vote. It's a critical we're gonna, issue. We're gonna move on Agreed. Now. We're gonna Everybody move on now to our next topic of discussion. All right, all right. We're gonna move on to our next topic of discussion. It's gonna be on economy and the jobs and jobs. While many areas of the country are seeing great economic gains since the Great Recession, District 10 has been slow to recover. The San Joaquin Valley as a whole has reached its peak in regards to employment growth and is currently in a slowdown according to the most recent issue of the San Joaquin Valley Business Forecast. Employment growth across California continues to outpace the valley. Along with evidence pointing to a slowdown in almost all categories of employment, inflation is rising uh, and interest rates are rising. Foreclosures are already climbing back up and all of those are areas of concern noted in the report. If elected, how would you help stimulate the economy, specifically in District 10, and address the growing housing crisis? Mr. Harder. You're right, we have a, a real economic challenge in this district. Uh, we have an unemployment rate close to twice the national average, it's gotten a little bit better. Uh, but we don't have the same chance at economic opportunity here as, uh, as other areas of California and other areas of the country. I think a lot about the story of Tri-Valley Growers, Peach Cannery, now Seneca, which had 10,000 jobs 20 years ago, produced 50% of the canned peaches across America. Anybody in America that has syrupy canned peach in their school lunch, it came from us. Uh, that cannery is going bankrupt. Uh, we're losing the remainder of those jobs. I've met with people who are being laid off, who are either struggling to find another job in this community, or they have to drive two to three hours away to find another job that pays as good as that one. Uh, the answer to this, I think, is pretty clear. Uh, we have two options. First, we can believe in trickle-down economics. Never worked before, but maybe it'll work this time. Uh, that bill that Jeff Benham voted for would raise taxes on Californians. Californians going to pay $12 billion more in individual taxes, uh, but it also added $2 trillion to the, to the national debt. Uh, maybe that will somehow stimulate the economy, even though it never has in the past. Uh, or we could take a second route, which is what I think. I think we should invest in the education and the infrastructure in districts that matter. There are programs that work. Uh, there's a program at a local high school that teaches 100 kids at risk of dropping out teaches those kids to install solar panels, drive a forklift, operate a robot, and in a district where 84% of adults don't have a college degree, uh, those kids graduate, they get a job at 20 bucks an hour the day after graduation. It's a program that works. And yet programs like that are federally funded. And they're getting zeroed out in the same Trump budget that made room for more tax cuts. You wanna know the secret to the economic success of the Central Valley? It's investing in us, and that's what I plan to do. Yeah. Well, let, let's start with that. That's a good way, uh, place to start. Uh, my business is right down the street. I am uh, hiring people here locally. It is a locally owned business, and my wife and I both own. Come see it. Don't shake your head. Come see it. But t take a look at his business. He raised health care rates, bought a health care company, raised the, the individual's rates by 30%, and then sent out a press release and bragged about it. He started a, as a venture capitalist. They bought it into another company that got government assistance, retrained the people under TANF, and then shipped the jobs to India. Now come on, these are real world issues here. Somebody who's actually in our community, creating jobs with their own business, and somebody that has a track record uh, as a venture capitalist that has done the exact opposite. But let us talk about the bill that uh, I did support. Um, I, I believe in tax cuts. In fact, yesterday we did a uh, uh, tax cuts work uh, uh, program here where we talked to a lot of local businesses uh, that are giving raises, that are giving bonuses, that are hiring people. Some companies do on all three. Currently, uh, you know, when I first took office, we were at 47,000 median income. We're at 63,000 median income today. Our growth rate is 4.2%. We actually have more jobs now than people looking for jobs. 
And while we had 17.5% unemployment rate when I was first elected, it's down to six. Can it be better? Absolutely it can. And I'm working right here in our community to continue to make our local economy better. But 17.5% down to six, almost a 20,000 median income growth, companies that are giving bonuses, raises, uh, and retirement accounts that have continued to grow. It's a pretty good economy right now, and it's hard to argue with that. Raising taxes, repealing those crumbs, the crumbs that would be $2,100 per family of four here would set us back. I'll stand behind my tax cut record. Mr. Hardy, do you have any rebuttal? You want to attack me for my business record, and I think you know that's a bucket of lies. Um, the reality is, is I've never been an employee, an executive, a member of a board of directors that raised prices in the healthcare markets. I've never outsourced jobs. That's ridiculous. You're just trying to make me seem as scary as possible because you know that you can't defend the actual record that you voted for in Congress because you know it's unpopular. Uh, you call it a tax cut. It raised taxes in California. We're Californians are going to pay $12 billion more in taxes. Right here in this district, you want to you talk about $2,100 more? A family of four in the Central Valley is going to pay $3,200 more in health care premiums next year because of that same bill. Now you tell me if you think getting $2,100 back and paying $3,200 back uh, for your health care uh, to stay the same is a good deal. I don't think it is. Uh, I think we need somebody who's going to actually focus on the needs of a district like ours instead of a massive corporate tax cut that's going to add trillions to the, de to the deficit, that's going to come out of our Medicare and Social Security. We know how they're going to pay for it. It's going to come at our risk and benefit. Uh, you know, the liberal stance that you take on uh, crumbs, uh, it's $2,100 per family. That's a big deal in our community. Um, you know, it might, so not be a lot, it might not be a lot for a venture capitalist, but $2,100 per family here. You know, look, don't take my word for it. Talk to people in our community that see it in their paycheck. Look at it every month on how your paycheck has changed. But those are, that's a big deal in our community. And yes, this is one of the few things that we don't have you on, on tape on, but we certainly have the press releases that you released. I'm happy to give those to the media as well. You can't outsource jobs. You can't uh, get a healthcare company that you raise rates on and then try to take an opposite position on it. Uh, look, again, I've got a record that speaks for itself. I'm proud of the tax cuts. I think that we need to do more of it. Raising taxes, especially coming up with $32 trillion worth of taxes, will devastate our economy, and you'll feel it in your pocketbook. Thank you. At this time, I'm going to remind the audience that uh, if you have a question that you would like us to ask the candidates, um, please write it on your index card if you haven't already, and take it to the back of the room to that table or raise your hand and we will collect them from you. If you need an index card and you don't have one, also you can raise your hand. And we're gonna do two more uh, journal and then see newspaper questions. And then we're going to start taking questions from the audience. So I'm gonna give you just a few seconds here to get your index cards in. All right, I'm going to move on to our next question. Our next question is about party leadership. As much as this election is about the issues, it's also a referendum on party leadership. If elected, will you support your party's leadership, even when their positions are not in the best interest of District 10 residents? Mr. Dunham? No, I've been vocal against my own party when I believe that they're not doing the right things. Uh, you know, I pushed that uh, on uh, immigration reform, uh, was willing to take on my own party, do a discharge petition, something I thought I would never do. Uh, but forcing a vote was, was that critical. Now, with that being said, um, I am proud of Kevin McCarthy. I think that he's going to be our next speaker. And uh, I think that he'll provide real leadership for the Valley. Uh, you know, our Valley policies are different from the Bay Area policies of Nancy Pelosi. Uh, we're gonna fight for water. We need to be united as Republicans and Democrats in the Valley. Um, and that valley leadership is, is critical. So yes, I'm looking forward to Kevin McCarthy being the next speaker, but when Kevin will tell you firsthand, I've opposed him on several different issues that uh, uh, I didn't feel were right for the north part of the valley. Mr. Harding? 
you have stood up to your party 2% of the time, and then 98% of the time you've done what your party has told you to do. The reality is, is that we live in a purple district. We all know that. Uh, we live in a district where a lot of people voted for Hillary Clinton and a lot of people voted for Donald Trump. We need a representative who's only going to do one thing, fight for the interests of our constituents, not be beholden to one party or another, and certainly not beholden to any corporate interests. And that's one of the reasons why I've decided uh, to not take a single dollar of corporate PAC money uh, as part of this campaign. Seventy percent of the dollars that go to Jeff Benham's campaign come from corporate PACs and special interests. That's who he's working for, and that explains so many of the ways he's voted, whether it's on the tax bill that raised taxes in California, whether it's on the health care disaster that would have taken health care away from 100,000 people, or whether or not it's the failures that we currently see all across this district on transportation. The reason that you know I'm voting for you, the reason I know you know that every single decision that I make is in the best interest of constituents in this district, because that's how we built our campaign. Unlike Jeff Benham, who hasn't done a town hall in a year and a half, we've done 16 town halls across the entirety of this district. Uh, we've done them in Turlock and Tracy and Manteca, all over the district with every single type of population. Everybody welcome, every question open and accessible. Because we need a, congr uh, a congressman that even if you don't, disagree, you don't agree with me on every single point, you want two very simple things out of me. You want me to show up, and you want me to tell you the truth. And when neither of those two things are happening, I think that means we need to change. Mr. Gunn, Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it, it is difficult to be up here and, and, and listen to this from somebody who and didn't vote for our water bonds, didn't vote for Barack Obama twice, uh, and didn't vote for our infrastructure uh, bill because he didn't vote. Those are all critical issues uh, in, our, in our community, important votes. Uh, so wanting to run for office while never voting yourself it is, is an issue. Um, but as well, taking barrier positions. Look, he has done these meetings uh, in the district uh, where we've got him on tape talking about uh, nine month full term abortion. Uh, publicly funded, it got the video of it. Uh, we also have the video on, it, on the Second Amendment. These are important issues. Now, he changes his position depending on which group he's talking to. My position is, is always the same. You want an answer? Again, whether I'm talking to a most conservative group, the most liberal group, I know what I believe in and I'll be consistent every single time. His health care plan, the same thing. Would eliminate uh, our, uh, our health insurance here locally. It is a critical issue. You can't just keep making things up or not answering. I mean, he still hasn't come up with the $32 trillion um, that he has no plan on how he's going to fund it other than raising our taxes. Thank you. Mr. Harden? You say you don't change your positions, and I think the reason you're hearing uh, such a strong backlash to this is because many of the people were here in your last town hall when you said you would vote against the health care bill. And the fact that a week and a half later you went back and voted for the exact same bill when you're in Washington, we got you on tape. Not only that, everybody here uh, remembers that moment very vividly because of the 100,000 people in this district that would have lost health care because of that. Uh, but you bring up uh, health care costs. And I don't know where you're getting this $32 trillion uh, 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 figure from. I think it's probably another one of your alternative facts. But the reality is, is you're right. We need to make sure that we're making health care more affordable for all Americans. Uh, one of the things that I'm really focused on is making sure we bring down prescription drug costs. Uh, Jeff Denham has taken $130,000 from the pharmaceutical lobby, $130,000. And he's voted consistently to not allow Medicare to negotiate with drug companies to bring down drug costs. One of the reasons that you can be assured that I'm fighting for the interests of this district is because I'm not taking corporate, uh, corporate PAC money, and I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure we bring down prescription drug costs that are way too high all across this district. OK, now that uh, you're all riled up talking about party leadership, <laughs> I'm going to now talk about bipartisanship. The country as a whole has become very divided. In Congress, bipartisanship has become almost a dirty word. If elected, what issue do you think you could collaborate on with your colleagues across the aisle? Mr. Harder? There's a number of, uh, of, of issues. The reality is, is this is a district that's pretty purple, as I said. And we can't have a representative that's going to vote 98% of the time with one party or another. Uh, we need somebody who's going to fight for us. There are two issues that I think about. One is infrastructure. Uh, the reality is, is I think this is something the President Trump was completely correct about. And he said we should be spending more money 
here at home. Uh, I was talking to a farmer the other day who uh, told me uh, bit by bit how the roads in his farm had degraded, about leading to, leading to him, so he had to buy a second truck um, because it, uh, the wheels were, were falling off because we haven't fixed our roads and bridges in this district for decades. Uh, we need to make sure that we have a massive dose of infrastructure funding that comes from Washington. Uh, the only way that that happens is if we get Republicans and Democrats uh, to work together on this issue. And the second is water. Uh, this is something that is not uh, a partisan issue in the Central Valley. It can't be. We need somebody who's going to make sure that we have the water resources all up and down uh, uh, the valley. Uh, we don't need to work with the folks down in Southern California who want to take our water through the Delta Tunnels, which uh, Jeff Denham voted for. We need to make sure that we have somebody who's going to make sure that we have the federal dollars for infrastructure programs, projects like the Sykes Reservoir, uh, which has not broken ground in 25 years because it hasn't gotten a single dollar of federal funding. That's going to take both Republicans and Democrats working together in Washington to make sure that we have uh, our fair share on water. Thank you, Mr. Well, one of the most bipartisan bills uh, that uh, recently came out of Congress was to stop the, the Bay Delta plan that he opposes. I've worked across party lines to pass an amendment to stop the state water grab, and he opposes it. He talks about water, but he opposes the plan that steals our water. I mean, it's, it's amazing, uh, the rhetoric that continues to go. But the New Water Act, the New Water Act bipartisan bill, Jim Costa and I just worked on it, actually has financing for the first time. Shasta, we just had a, a, a news come out of uh, Washington, D.C. that they're supporting our plan. Uh, again, bipartisan for Shasta. But let me go back to my first few terms. You know, President Obama, one of my first bills that uh, he signed was the uh, Vet Skills to Jobs Act. Uh, something that I dealt with when I was on active duty, I believe that when, as soon as I left active duty, I'd actually be able to find a job immediately doing the same thing that I was trained to do in the military. It was difficult to change the Department of Defense on this issue, but it took bipartisan work, not only in the House and Senate, but to get President Obama to sign up. The last bill that he signed was my Civilian Property Realignment Act, which I'd worked on for six years, to reduce our debt, to sell off the things that we don't need, get rid of properties that are costing us billions of dollars every year in maintenance and upkeep and security, and actually sell them off and lower our debt in the process. Bipartisan work, bipartisan track record. And one of the last things on veterans, to get French Camp built, our new mega clinic that will serve our veterans that his plan would eliminate, we actually got it done on a bipartisan basis. I work with Jerry McNerney, Eric Swalwell, and I work with uh, Jim Costa all the time. We work together because water is that critical. And when we had 1,500 people from the Valley go up to Sacramento, uh, because of the state water grab, it wasn't Republicans or Democrats. It was all of us working together. Adam Gray and I stood side by side with Jim Costa. In fact, there were Democrat candidates to run. He was too busy doing something else than fighting on our number one issue, probably because he opposes the bill that would actually stop the state water grab. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Mr. Harder? Again, that something else that I was too busy doing is something you're not very familiar with. It was, it was meeting with actual constituents in a town hall with community leaders okay. in our district. It was all live streamed. You're welcome to go watch it and, uh, and see the discussion that we had. Uh, I would encourage you to do a town hall. Again, I know many people would be really uh, excited to have one uh, after a year and a half of absence from the public discourse of this district. Uh, you bring up the Bay Delta plan, and you're right. I vehemently oppose the Bay Delta plan. Uh, Sacramento's plan to steal water from our district is, is absolutely awful. But I notice again and again you stop short of talking about the Delta Tunnels. Uh, we have two political problems in our water in this district. One is the uh, State Water Board's decision to cut water allocations by 40%. We both agree that that's a terrible thing. Uh, but the second is to ship water from Northern California down to Southern California. And that's where we differ, because I think that's terrible. And I also haven't taken a single dollar from farmers down in Southern California that would profit immensely uh, from that vote. Jeff Denham has taken thousands of dollars from those farmers, and he also voted to fast track that Delta Tunnel bill, which would make our water problems even worse. Yeah, you haven't raised much money from farmers at all. 99% of your money is coming out of the Bay Area. That's why we call you Bay Area Harder. Come on. I mean, this is a Bay Delta plan. Please, that no. you, we, I'm sorry. Uh, we have continued to fight Republicans and Democrats to stop the state water grab. You oppose the bill that would stop the state water grab. I mean, it is amazing. It is difficult to debate somebody when they change their position all the time. But I will tell you, you know, he talks about Agreed. me being with the public. We've accepted six debates, 
Six debates we've been uh, encouraged to go to. The House, the faith-based community was too controversial. The Spanish uh, church uh, over in Oakdale, he didn't want to do it because he didn't want to be able to do it in Spanish. Uh, the Modesto Rotary, the Rotary Club was too controversial to go out and have a debate. I am glad that he's here today, but it is difficult to debate somebody that changes their position in every time they have another meeting. And again, you don't have to take my word for it. We've got it on video. We'll roll tape after this, and we'll show you the press releases that he sent out. Uh, looking forward to that. Look, League of Women Voters invited you to a debate. I think they're still here and back. Is what I'm hearing from this that you're accepting a debate with the League of Women Voters? Is that what you're going to accept? You're going to do one with Rotary? They're very controversial these days. <laughs> we, we, we're we're going to be everywhere. Uh, Any time there's a non-partisan uh, third um, that don't have the exact same opportunities. This is a bipartisan issue. It should be uh, to make sure that we have the educational resources, the health care, and the immigration reforms necessary to make sure that every kid in the Central Valley is allowed the same chance to succeed here as anywhere else in America. Thank you, Mr. Gunn. You have your thoughts? Yeah, look, Professor, I, I know you talk a lot about MJC. My son Austin is out here today. He's a student at MJC. He's been trying to take your class, but apparently there isn't one. He'd love to go in and have some office hours with you because he actually wanted to see your business plan on outsourcing jobs and how you make money as a venture capitalist. But look, it is, it is an, an important issue. You know, again, we're joking around up here on some, some issues. Uh, I think it's fun to be lighthearted on, on some of these things because uh, I've got a record to stand on, fighting for the valley, something I'm very proud of. We've got to fight to get our water, our infrastructure. Putting a billion dollars on Highway 99 was a big big thing, but it's only helped to fix uh, very little expansion and some, some of the potholes. We've got to do much, much better um, and, and moving towards the future, bringing ACE train all the way over, uh, expanding our freight rail and getting dedicated track for, uh, for ACE. Um, and we've got to make sure that we're uh, expanding our infrastructure all the way around from roads to, to water storage. Mr. Harmon? You're right. There's, we're talking about a lot of different issues, and sometimes it can be complicated. Let's boil it down to four main differences. Uh, health care. The difference between somebody that believes that every single individual in the Central Valley deserves access to health care and somebody that voted to kick 100,000 people off of health care. Uh, immigration. Somebody that believes that every immigrant in the Central Valley deserves a path to citizenship, and somebody who would vote to make sure that we have a clean DREAM Act in the House. Not somebody who would co-sponsor it and write a press release and then refuse to sign a petition to bring that to a vote if it actually came to it in the House. Uh, water. Uh, somebody that actually believes that Northern California should get every single drop and somebody that voted to fast track the Delta Tunnels. Jobs. Somebody that actually made sure uh, that he voted for a bill that would raise taxes on Californians by $12 billion while adding $2 trillion to the national debt. Kind of a mathematical miracle there. Uh, how we can raise taxes and get uh, benefits uh, at the same time. And me, somebody that actually believes that we should be investing in the education and infrastructure here in the district. So there's a lot of stuff to talk about. Those are four pretty big differences. They are pretty big differences. And, and you got to at least be truthful with the group that's here. Again, you're on record. Raising income taxes, raising the gas tax, $32 trillion is what your health plan is. Look, it's one thing to have a plan, and I can appreciate that, but have a way to finance it too. I do take tough votes. My record is out there. Now, I know that you've decided to start voting, but at least if you're going to run for office, be honest with people and put your information out there. I'm hopeful that you will change your website and say how you're coming up with the $32 trillion. That's not my numbers. Every group across the country has, has said that your plan is 32 to 40 trillion dollars. The best you can do is repeal the tax cuts, which would cost everybody $2,100 per family, and raise the top 2%, again, raising taxes here locally. That gets you $2 trillion. Do the math. I know you're a smart guy, Professor. Come up with the other $30 trillion and explain it to people. This is a great question, and I actually think you're uh, you're right, it's kind of amazing that we only hear about costs and the federal deficit when it's other people's plans. We didn't hear it from you when you were voting to add $2 trillion to the national debt. Uh, we're not hearing anything about health care costs when, because of the Republican sabotage of the bills that you voted for, families of four in the Central Valley are going to have premium increases of 50% next year. That's what we can't afford. The reality is, is my plan is cheaper. It is cheaper to put an individual on Medicare 
Uh, if you look at if somebody who's 64 years old who's on private insurance, uh, you look at somebody who's getting health care through Covered California and Stanislaus County, those are the markets that are going up by 50%. They went up 20% last year due to Republican sabotage of our health care exchanges. And you say, this is somebody that should be on Medicare. Medicare has lower costs. It has better patient satisfaction. It has better patient outcomes. And you're right. I think if you were to take that program and you were to say, instead of those people getting less efficient, higher administrative costs of private insurance that's going up by 50%, and you put that same individual on Medicare, I think that's uh, most people in this district are going to agree that's a pretty good idea. All right. In the last eight years, health care has continued to go up. The Obamacare, uh, under the, even the first year, it went up in price. It's still going up today. And even Nancy right. Pelosi will tell you that this plan will cost more money. Hey. There's no cost savings. You know what? I give both the candidates equal opportunity if they want to continue to discuss something. And if Mr. Harder's amenable to another one minute rebuttal, then that is fine with me. If you'd like to move on. I think we said what we're going to say, unless All right. you're. We're going to move on then to the next question. The next question is You would be representing a district that depends heavily on agriculture. Agriculture depends on predictability of growing conditions. What are you willing to do to address the threat of man made climate change to our farmers' ability to predict water availability and growing conditions? Mr. Harder? Well, I think we should start by stipulating that man-made climate change exists. Uh, as far as I know, I don't think I've ever heard Congressman Denham ever say that man-made climate change is a real thing and is affecting uh, the Central Valley. We live off the land here. We went through seven years of drought. We're seeing fire seasons in California go completely out of control, go year-round and being much worse uh, than they are. And we face the impacts of that every single day. We have the worst air quality here in the Central Valley. I had childhood asthma as a kid. Uh, the reality is, is growing up here, a lot of the pollution isn't even caused by the Central Valley. It's caused by coal plants in China uh, that send up their pollution. They go over the Pacific Ocean, and then they settle in the first valley that they find, which is us. We bear the costs of an international problem right here. If only we had an international agreement, maybe the Paris Climate Accord, that could do something about that. <laughs> oh, wait, we actually had that. Uh, it was a great idea. Every single country in uh, the world signed on to it until America uh, uh, took out. And if there's one thing that I learned in my business career, it's that if you're not having a seat at the table, you're on the menu. And the reality is, is the rest of the world is moving ahead. They're investing in renewables. Uh, they are mitigating the effects of climate change. And here in America, we can't get even get on the same page because we have congressmen like Jeff Benham who are getting a heavy amount of funding from the Koch brothers who won't even say that man-made climate change is, uh, is real. And they can't even be honest with their constituents about the real impacts that we're seeing and what we need to do if we're going to be able to prepare this valley for the next 100 years. Thank you. Mr. Denham? Yeah, the reality of the situation with our, uh, with our air quality is that uh, we follow different regulations here in the valley than the Bay Area does even though we are burdened with so much of the Bay Area smog that comes over to the valley and settles over here. Um, it is a real issue. It's one that I've uh, fought on. Again, a bipartisan issue that we have fought together uh, to make sure that uh, there's um, see some equality here uh, for the valley. But look, there are a number of liberal policies that uh, affect our air quality here. If we do not manage our forests, Mother Nature manages our forests for us. And we end up not only losing water that uh, goes through those forests, but we lose the air quality as they burn up and they risk the lives of our firefighters. You know, one of the cleanest, uh, the cleanest uh, energy that we do have isn't even considered renewable energy. It's hydro. <laughs> Every time we try to add new hydro here, um, it is some, some of those liberal groups that try to fight us on it. Hydroelectricity is not only our most consistent renewable energy, but it is our greenest energy that our farmers depend on. The Bay Delta plan, the state water grab, will empty our reservoir one out of every four years. We not only lose the water and water quality, but we lose the hydro green electricity with it. We used to have a lot more biomass here. Allow us to trim our trees and, and uh, prune our crops and utilize that for biomass. We uh, have had a lot of those biomass facilities shut down. We've also made some big gains with solar and wind, working with companies here. We can do better. 
and I think that we must. But it starts with hydroelectricity. That gives us the greatest certainty for our farmers and does it the best for our farmers to be able to plant more trees that contribute the most to our environment. There were a couple of things that I didn't hear in that answer. <laughs> Mr. Denham, do you believe, do you accept the scientific consensus that man-made climate change is real? Yes or no? You want me to take some of your time? All yours. Thank you for yielding back. Yes, I, I do believe in climate change. I've been out there on record. Man, on man made. Scientific consensus that man made climate change is real. Uh, I don't believe that liberal policies can continue to shut down our number one industry of agriculture. Please, we need to be able to hear. We need to be able to hear what the candidates are saying. We need to be able to hear the candidates, please. When you penalize our farmers for tilling the land or running a pump, which is how they get their water, that is not something that helps our farmers to plant more trees, which is actually the best thing for our environment and for cleaning our air. And I do believe that uh, if we're going to talk about climate change, the Bay Area has a stake in this as well. They ought to pay the same fees and have the same penalties that we have here in the Valley. Again, it's something that Republicans and Democrats in the Valley have been working for and fighting for. We shouldn't have to pay for the Bay Area's dirty air. And yes, again, I believe in climate change. Man-made. OK, I'm going to move on to the next question. I think we heard what we needed. I, I, Bay Area made. Yes, Bay Area made climate change. I <laughs> Okay, so the next question is, what's your stance on abortion? Mr. Denham? I'm pro-life. I've been very clear on my position. My mom carried me in high school. Um, I know how difficult it was uh, for a very young family. Um, but Mr. Harder uh, takes some very extreme positions. He's out on video saying nine months full term Abortion is something that he supports. Now, again, don't take my word for it. Look at the video. But then secondly, he doubles down on it. And somebody in the audience says, with no exceptions? He says, no, no exceptions. And he talks about the Hyde Amendment. The government should pay for it as well. Look, again, don't take my word for it. Look at the video. Read the press. These are his positions. We have more of them on video. But it's a very extreme liberal position. That might sell in the Bay Area. I don't think that it sells here in the Valley. Mr. Hunter? I've been very clear. I, I'm pro-choice. I believe uh, in a woman's right to choose. And I'm uh, willing to support it. I, I think that it's not the role of government to get between a woman and her doctor. And I think these are very difficult health decisions uh, to be made and that government should be weigh, shouldn't be weighing the scales, and that the right person to make these very difficult decisions uh, are individual women. That's who I trust, uh, and that's why I'm pro-choice. Uh, and you're right, I, I misunderstood a question. Uh, the reality is, is nine terms of abortion isn't even a real thing. Uh, it turns out you can't have nine terms. And uh, I support California law, which is that uh, a woman has a right to choose up to 24 weeks uh, after conception, I think that's the right thing uh, here in the Valley, and I think most people in the Valley do support that. Um, if you want to roll back protections uh, and go back to the 1950s, then that, that's your decision. Uh, I think that the world that we live in now is a lot better than the one we had five decades ago, and I think a woman's right to choose is a big reason for that. But I also think we need to be doing more. Uh, I think we need to make it much easier to have reproductive services uh, access. Uh, to women, so fewer women have to make that difficult decision. Uh, and I think we should make it much easier to, uh, to uh, offer adoption. Uh, my brothers adopted. It was uh, very hard and, quite frankly, very expensive because in California and across this country, it can cost tens of thousands of dollars uh, to adopt. Uh, that's not right. Uh, we should not make it hard uh, to find kids a good home. We should be making it much easier. Think about all the kids uh, in America that would be doing much better if we made it so much easier to adopt and make sure the kids found homes that were actually going to, uh, uh, to allow them to be their best selves. So I'm pro-choice. We've been very consistent in this. And I want to make sure that we have uh, a woman's right to choose be protected. But at the same time, fewer women have to make that very difficult decision. I would agree that you have been very. Uh 
you have been very clear about being pro-choice. Um, I, I think that the challenge here is that you just can't keep changing your position. Uh, you know, again, the video says it, it, it's one thing to say you misunderstood that it was full term or that it was nine months. But then somebody in the audience says, well, no exceptions? And you say, yeah, no exceptions. And then you go on to talk about the Hyde Amendment and government funding up through that nine month abortion. That is your position. And I hope that it would, I hope that it has changed or that would change or that you actually understand the question better. But as a father, I understand what nine months means. Uh, I understand that uh, kids are pain capable at 20 weeks. Um, it is a serious issue and it, you know, nine months full term is just disgusting. I think it's pretty interesting to be lectured on changing a position when you tell us exactly what we want to hear on every single issue in this district. When you stood in front of a thousand constituents a year and a half ago and said you would vote no on that health care bill. And then you went back to Washington and you voted for it. Uh, when you come back to this district and you say, no, I believe in immigration reform, and then you go back to Washington and you vote with your party 98% of the time. So don't give me any lectures about changing position when you just tell us again and again what we want to hear on every single issue and then go back and vote with your party 98% of the time. Look, every two years somebody moves back to this district to run against me, I'll lecture you all I want because I know what I believe in. Uh, this is something I've got a record that uh, I stand strongly behind. And yeah, you know what, the easy vote would have been to, to, to vote uh, no on the health care bill until I actually got uh, the uh, provision in there to, for pre-existing condition, which is exactly what I told people. The pre-existing condition was important to me because my father had a pre-existing condition. So we had that in the bill, but that wasn't enough. We added two provisions for access to care, which is critical to this community. So yeah, would I do it again? Absolutely I would. I'm proud of my vote. The easy vote is always to vote no. But standing on courage, putting your vote out there, when you know people are not gonna like some of the things in there, when you've gotta explain all aspects of a bill, I'll explain it now like I explained it then. Pre-existing condition is important to me, it's in the bill. Access to health care is important to me. I passed the bill, extended residency programs here. Go to some of our, our federally qualified health centers and see that they've got residency programs now. Go take a look at doctors getting paid so they'll actually see Medi-Cal patients. Stop making promises and actually look at some okay. of the jobs that are getting done around here. Thank you, thank you. Mr. Harder. Okay. Please calm down, please. We're trying to get through as many of these questions, your questions. Mr. Harder, would you like a minute rebuttal, please? This isn't me saying you changed your mind. I think everybody in this district understands when you said you would vote against that bill and then a week and a half later you changed your mind, nothing of substance had changed. They got $4 billion for high-risk pools for pre-existing conditions. So what, $4 billion for high-risk pools for pre-existing conditions? We know that's not going to do anything. And it's not me saying that. It's the nonpartisan uh, Congressional Budget Office, which said it would have kicked 100,000 people in this district off of health care. It's the Modesto B that said because of your vote, we would lose 7,000 health care jobs in this community. And it's not just that, it's the premium increase that we're seeing every single day, the 20% increase in premiums. So if you want to actually see the implications of that vote and what it's done in our community, look at your health care prices over the next year. When premiums skyrocket in the Central Valley by 50%, we're going to know who's responsible. The Urban Institute, okay. I think the Modesto B, and the uh, Congressional Budget all Office right. all say your plan is over $32 billion. Okay, we're going to move on to our next question. This is going to be our last question before the candidate's closing statement. Each of you are claiming that the other is relying on outside money. How much of your funds are coming from the 10th District? Mr. Harder? The way that this is reported is actually a not correct, because the reality is, is donations less than 200 bucks are not reported to the FEC with a zip code, and my average contribution for our campaign is $25. We're financing our campaign the right way, and I'm very proud of it. Uh, I'm proud that we're building a campaign based on giving people, ordinary people, not large corporations, not billionaires, ordinary people, a voice. Uh, that's what you've seen in our volunteers, and that's what you've seen in our campaign donations, and that's why I've I'm not going to take a single dollar of corporate PAC money. Remember, that's 70% of the campaign donations that go to Jeff Benham come from corporate PACs and special interests. That is who he's working for. Uh, and it's not just that. One of Jeff Benham's largest campaign contributors 
is a congressman down in Southern California who just got federally indicted for campaign finance fraud. This may sound like a very low bar, uh, but I'm not going to accept a single dollar of money from a federally indicted member of Congress. Now, that's not a pledge that my opponent can make. Well, your events over in the Bay Area with Barbara Lee and Nancy Pelosi and you know, the travel that you do down in uh, L.A. to raise money, I, I think they do speak for themselves. But, you know, the, the things that you, uh, you criticize, you know, I, I've taken a number of, uh, of contributions from unions. IBEW, actually the electrical contractors, are, are uh, ones that you've accepted. It's not a corporate I've accepted, fact. I've accepted as well. Uh, but the firefighters, I think they ought to have a voice. Uh, the Farm Bureau, yeah, of course they should have a voice too. There are a number of PACs out there. I belong to political action committees as a farmer, as a business owner. Uh, realtors, I think that that's uh, another one that ought to make a decision on who they're going to support because of the policies that they support. So yeah, I am proud of that, but, but more so I, I am proud of the local uh, contributions that we receive every single day. From people that I talk to that are proud of the tax cuts, uh, ones that uh, are donating for the first time because they have a little extra money, some of the local businesses. And I don't criticize the larger farmers just because they've been successful. I support, they support me because I have a farming background and I'm going to support the policies that they represent. So look, I am proud of uh, what we've done in this community and the fact that we've got uh, our local community members that uh, are supporting my, my campaign. That is my fight. I will always fight for the Valley, and I'll go up and down the Valley raising money uh, to help support a campaign, rather than having outside money and, and uh, Bay Area ads that are run on my behalf. I don't have any problem with the fact that the firefighters wrote you a check. I think that's great. They're not a corporate PAC. I have a problem with the fact that pharmaceutical companies wrote you $130,000, and in response, you voted to, not make, to make sure that Medicare couldn't negotiate lower drug prices. That's what I have a problem with. Uh, I have a problem with the fact that you took millions of dollars from corporate, uh, corporations like AT&T, Verizon, Comcast, and you voted against net neutrality. Uh, I have a problem with the fact that you took hundreds of thousands of dollars from farmers down in Southern California from large corporations who would profit from the Delta Tunnels, and then you voted to fast track that bill. I have a problem with the fact that you voted for a bill that would add $2 trillion to the national debt while raising taxes on Californians by $12 billion after taking millions of dollars of corporate PAC money. That's what I have a problem with, and that's what I'm not accepting a dime of. Thank you. Thank you. Look, the, the nice thing about uh, uh, these campaigns, at least when it comes to your account, it's, it's the transparency. It, it is a, a much bigger challenge uh, when, you know, Bloomberg's doing 80 million, Steyer, I mean, all of these big, rich people are coming in with millions of dollars a week to run ads against me. You don't see them turning those down or talking uh, against those. It, it just happens every two years. Um, but I'm proud of the fact that I raise money in the Valley. It's what I do. Uh, I, I've got to work on behalf of my constituents in my community, and my record should speak for itself uh, based on that. And uh, yeah, you know, again, his political uh, things that he criticizes me for, it's like the Farm Bureau. I'm proud to take money from the Farm Bureau. Uh, I need their help. I need them out putting my signs up on all of their farms. Um, but I, I'm not ever gonna apologize for fighting for the Valley or fighting for our water needs. Again, I've introduced the bill. Um, uh, you can always attack me on my votes, but I vote. I show up every day, and I vote, and I vote in every election. Okay, okay, thank you. All right, now we are going to go to our concluding statements. And Mr. Denham? Well, thank you. Um, I really do appreciate the opportunity to come in and debate. I think it's important to, uh, to share ideas. Um, I wish that uh, we had done it with the Farm Bureau or done it with uh, the faith-based community or even the Rotary. Um, but I'm glad that we're here today and I'm glad that we did the one at the Modesto B. Uh, at least it uh, puts us on record on differences of issues. There are big differences here. Um, 
and, and look, I'll, I'll say it again. My record of working with Democrats, working across the party, across party lines, is because I'm fighting for the valley. That meant working with President Obama. It meant working with my Democrat colleagues uh, um, and passing a number of bills my first term, my second term, for veterans, for our community, for our farmers, for our water storage, and we're seeing real success. I'm proud of the tax cuts. I talk to people every day. The tax cuts are working. You see it in our economy. You see it in your retirements. Uh, you see it in your paychecks. It's not something that you should have either one of us making a decision on. You take a look at your 401k. You take a look at the unemployment rate here. You take a look at your paycheck. And then you make a decision whether these tax cuts were good for you. And then judge us on our water policy. He opposes my bill that stops the state water grab, the one that I've done with Jim Costa and Valley Democrats. I'm against the tunnels. Well, our district is not necessarily affected by them because we're south of the Delta. We're still the Valley, and it is important to stay together on water issues, whether it's water storage, conveyance, or clean water. And we've done that together. We have some big fights here. We have some big issues where the Valley has to pull together, and you need strong leadership to do it. I've been that voice in Sacramento, I've been that voice in Washington, D.C., and I'd be proud to represent you one more time uh, in our United States Capitol. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Harder? Thank you so much for, for being here. Look, I, I'm running because I love this community. I'm a fifth generation resident. Many of you know my great-great-grandfather started his peach farm in Manteca in 1850. Uh, but I grew up here in Turlock, and everything that I was given was by this community. Uh, this community based, invested very deeply in me. From my first job at the Turlock Journal and the Modesto Bee as a paper boy at age 12, uh, to going through the public school system, uh, the teachers at Modesto High that invested very deeply in me and taught me to dream big and go far, to the Modesto Rotary Club and the American Legion that gave me a scholarship to go off to college. But I'm running for very, one very simple reason, which is that most kids in this district don't have access to the same opportunities that I did growing up. Uh, the fact that 80% of our kids are on free or reduced lunch in our school districts, the fact that we have an unemployment rate twice the national average. And on every issue that I care about in this community, I see our political leadership moving us backwards instead of forwards. Again, this is a crystal clear campaign. And if everybody goes to the polls, and thinks about the individuals in their lives with pre-existing conditions who would be hurt because of Jeff Denham's vote. If everybody goes to the polls and they think about the immigrants in our community, the dreamers who have gone unprotected over the last two years because of this Congress's failure. If everybody goes to the polls and thinks about the water resources that we need, that we would lose if 9,000 cubic feet of that every second got shipped down to Southern California through the tunnels. Uh, that's the issues that are critical in this district. Um, and look, Mr. Denham talks a good game back in Washington, but I think what we all agree, uh, back in the district, what we all agree is to look at his votes uh, back in Washington. We need somebody who's going to fight for us, who's not going to be a Republican or a Democrat, uh, but somebody that's going to be against party politics, not going to get lost in partisan bickering, but is going to actually deliver real results here in the Valley. Judge me by how we're running this campaign, join one of our 16 town halls, and. Mr. Denham, again, I, I would love to have you join them. I think uh, doing a town hall would be a, a great opportunity to get some live questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Congressman Denham and Mr. Harder. Thank you so much for participating. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in with us and joining us today for the congressional debate.